My name is Rand Ackroyd, and on behalf of the Plumbing and Drainage Institute, I want to welcome you to our website and this web seminar on Greece, myths, and facts. The Plumbing and Drainage Institute, the sponsors of this web seminar, was formed in 1949. EDI was the organization that developed the original performance requirements for grease interceptors. That document is PDI G01, and it's available today in Revision 2007 as a free download from our website. Plumbing and Drainage Institute since 1949 has had the same objectives, and those are the advancement of engineered plumbing products through publicity, public relations, research, publishing of standards, and education such as this web seminar. Grease, how bad can it be? We're all familiar with these small amounts of grease that occur from our normal everyday cooking. That grease in the bottom of the fry pan, the, the grease that we rinse off of our dishes. But when we get into a commercial kitchen uh, or food processing uh, environment, the amount of grease, those small amounts, can add up. And it can add up to a disaster in the plumbing and drainage system. Today we have a format of myths and facts, and we're going to go over the 10 most popular myths that relate to grease and grease interception. Myth number one, if grease is not used in food preparation, a grease interceptor is not needed. The fact is that grease is not the only problem. The overall problem is characterized as FOG, which stands for fats, oils, and greases. These materials alone, or in combination, will result in sewer blockages. Myth number two. Choosing a large size grease interceptor will result in greater grease removal efficiency. The facts are, when a grease interceptor has been sized properly to the anticipated maximum flow, using a grease interceptor with a larger flow capacity will not increase a grease removal efficiency. Myth number three. The larger the grease storage, the more efficient the interceptor. Well, the fact is that the grease must first be separated from the wastewater before it can be stored. And these are two different functions within the grease interceptor. The storage capacity and grease removal efficiency are not related. Myth number four. The grease must cool and harden to separate from the wastewater. The fact is grease interceptors separate based on the difference in the specific gravity of the FOG, the grease oil and fats. The difference in specific gravity between the FOG and the water. Liquefied grease floats just as well as solidified grease. Grease is lighter than water and that's the principles of grease interception. Myth number five, hot water will melt the grease and wash the grease through the interceptor. The fact is, all hydromechanical grease interceptors, when they're tested for their performance per PDI G101, are tested with both the water and the grease at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Myth six, once the grease is captured in the interceptor, it will remain captured in the interceptor as long as the interceptor is not yet 25% full. This 25% that I'm referring to here is actually a rule of thumb in the industry uh, that is being supported. And it's called the 25% rule. And what it actually relates to is that when the volume of grease measured as the depth in the interceptor reaches 25% of the depth of the interceptor, that would leave us with 25% of the top as being grease, 75% of the bottom as being water. When this level is reached, it's the proper time to clean the interceptor. Well, the fact is, because grease, the FOG, is contaminated with food particles, the interceptor is a breeding ground for bacteria. The longer the grease remains in the interceptor, the more of this microbial action takes place. As the grease is broken down, fog can actually exit the interceptor and create blockages downstream. 
That's why timely cleaning of the interceptor is necessary, and it's not always simply the 25% rule. Myth number seven. Oversizing an interceptor cannot hurt. The facts have been proven over again in actual field installations that oversizing an interceptor relative to the actual flow is a problem. This decrease in flow can actually promote the generation of hydrogen sulfide gas that can then be converted to hydrochloric acid. Both metal and concrete structures downstream have suffered severe structural damage from this acid. Myth number eight. With a change to healthier cooking oils, there is less of a FOG, that's oil and grease problem. Well, the healthier cooking oils that I'm referring to, you've probably all heard of, and they're called zero trans fats. But even though these cooking oils are healthier for you, they are not healthier for the drainage system. They are all polar hydrocarbons. In fact, some of the new alternative cooking oils with specific gravities close to that of water will be harder to capture from the wastewater. Myth number nine. When the grease interceptor is full, the drain line will stop flowing. Well, the fact is, water will continue to flow even when the FOG, the grease in the interceptor, is at its capacity. The additional grease in the wastewater at that point will simply flow straight through the interceptor and not be separated out. Grease interceptors must be monitored either manually or electronically to assure that the grease is at a proper level and that it is removed in a timely manner. Myth number 10, grease does not clog plastic pipe. Well, grease can generate blockages in all types of drainage materials. This slide here is showing a PVC pipe that has been clogged with FOG. One might think that plastic pipe being a smoother surface than either cast iron or concrete is less prone to clogging problems. As this picture clearly shows, even PVC plastic pipe is not immune to fog blockage problems. I want to thank you for your time and hope that you have enjoyed our presentation on myths and facts. Have a nice day.